Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Christy Gordon, and today I'm joined by the amazing sculptor Sherlyn Hendrick to talk about how she found her artistic voice. And Sherlyn's work has been shown in museums and galleries across Canada and the United States. And she's been the recipient of several major awards, including the Phoenix Gallery Solo Competition Award, curated by Lisa Dennison, the chief curator of the Guggenheim Museum. So welcome, Sherlyn. It's so good to have you. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so good to see you again. Um, so I know we bo both first met in my hometown of Nelson, and it was really surprising to me because as we talked more, we discovered that we had actually both graduated from the New York Academy of Art, and we both had that history. And and you know, and then I found that you really found your voice, and you have this like really distinctive, unique voice. And so I was curious, looking back at the work you were doing at the Academy in 1997, um, what can you see like what sort of things were you working with back then and how has your work evolved? Hmm. Well, back then I was uh, actually went to the school because I was interested in figurative art. And um, I, I earned my career was as a physical therapist. So it was sort of a natural, you know, leaning towards something figurative. And um, so that's why I chose that school. And I was someone um, who, well, I was always a kid who kind of, you know, drew, did art things, always doing something creative. And when I was 13, I was in a little art, you know, arts class in school, and I did this head of a of a kid in class. It was only tiny, maybe four inches tall, and it was in clay. And in that moment, it was like, I'm, I had the sense, I'm going to do sculpture. I can do this. It it took me till I was uh, around 39 or 40 to actually do something in art, which was I saw a class in Berkeley. It was called The Way of the Doll. And it was about making, uh, it wasn't like making Betsy Wetsies. It was, it was about making, uh, you would take porcelain. It was a year long process class. And in that class, you would make one, one doll and it was made out of the first one I did was life size. It was made out of had big horns. It sat in, in an armoire. It was for the fabric and porcelain. And, you know, it, it was, you know, that was my first project, but I started right in doing sculpture. So I wasn't, didn't actually make dolls. And I'm mentioning that to say that when I, I had moved to New York because I married somebody from New York who was living in New York at the time. That's how I ended up there. And um, I, he just suggested, why don't you apply to a master's program? And I applied to the New York Academy of Art based on five pieces that I made. And that's how I started. That's interesting. And it's interesting to hear about the like the doll class that you took and that it had actually had horns because now you're working a lot with animals and that almost seems like maybe... Maybe there was some thread of interest that, like, was even coming through back then. I wonder. You know, that's an interesting <laughs> point. I've never <laughs> thought about that. Yeah, <laughs> but you're probably you're probably right. You know, in in the in back in the '80s in that time period, you know, I was interested in a lot of things like shamanism. I went to Peru with the shaman and traveled through Peru with him. You know, I studied you know altered states of consciousness. I did. I worked with a research scientist in um, UC, who was from UCLA, Irving, in past life explorations. So I think there was, you know, sort of an influence that's probably somewhere where that animal influence comes from. I was interested in what power animals were, you know, that kind of thing. So that's probably why yeah. I relate to your work so much. I, I really do. And and I have similar interests. So, and I didn't know that about you. That's really cool. Um, yeah. Well, you're kind of touching on a bit about how your background, like you, you kind of ties into your voice. Like you mentioned that you were a physical therapist and then your experience with shamanism and in, in Peru. Um, what other, are there any other aspects that you can think of? Or do you want to talk a bit more about that, about how your background influenced your voice? Well, I think in all that, just in my own kind of personal growth, I got interested in the psychological aspects of things. And I'm interested, I mean, the reason why I went into, was interested in shamanism, it was basically as a method of self-healing. And I was also interested in 
aspects of healing as regards to physical therapy clients that I had. So I studied also with a, a woman in, in Berkeley. Her name was Marion Rosen, and she uh, was a physical therapist who escaped from Germany during World War II. And uh, she developed a whole technique of working on the body that involved verbal, emotional work while you're actually touching a body with the idea of releasing emotions through the verbal and hands-on technique. So so that, that also influences, you know, where I went with sculpture because in the last body of work I did, which was a series called Caged, it was about the, about, it was a bestiary that, where the animals in this group of sculptures betrayed um, human emotions. And uh, so that also influences wh where I went with the sculptures. Ooh, that's interesting. And how was the process, like, as you sort of honed your voice and sort of refined it? And I feel like it has become really distinctive and sort of different from the work you were doing like originally which looked more traditional but really amazing and skilled um but now it just seems even more distinctive with the bright colors and the you know and the animals and the kind of mystical feel what was the process like for you like how did that start to happen what were the signs that it was starting to come out <laughs> okay. well the circumstances of my life you know all that what i've just mentioned but the circumstances of finances also dictated where i went so i couldn't afford to do bronze sculptures period so i said okay well i'll <laughs> i'll learn to work in clay so when i moved to canada i um you know said so, so, well let me figure out how to do this so I started, uh, first of all, I, I started working with a coil technique, which for, for people who don't know, it's where you roll out tubes of clay and then you put one, one roll on top of another or coil and, you, and from the bottom up, I would make a sculpture. So that, that in itself added some limits. You couldn't, you know, it was, you, you can't, you know, be as free flowing with how an arm goes out in space, let's say, or, you know, a tail goes out, in, you know, because in that process of building up the clay, it has to dry to a certain degree as you're adding on layers. So if a sculpture takes three months to make, during that whole time, you're controlling the weight of the clay, how wet the clay is, and how... um uh, you know, and the drying process. So, so part of it isn't drying out while you're adding new wet clay. So, so uh, you know, it this this these animals became as a result. I said, well, I'm not going to be able to do the kind of human figure I want to do because I can't build it up as much. But I can do it with animals, and also, <laughs> also animals. Uh, you can be really you can really mess around with their proportions and it doesn't have to be realistic. It, you know, sometimes, sometimes if you're doing like a humanistic, say you were doing a realistic human figure, if, if it's a little off, the viewer kind of knows it's off. They may not know why, but it bothers them with an animal. You can do anything and it's not going to bother anybody, you know? So it's sort of evolved. That's how the animal started in a way. Wasn't it? And also, it's yeah. That's basically how it started. Wow. It was to develop a whole nother technique that I could afford to do. Oh, that's so cool! Because in some ways, the limitations then, like the limitations of the medium and the way that you're working. Because you showed me before the coils, and it's actually very difficult. <laughs> um, but it, um, it I, that I can totally understand how it sort of led to this like new direction. And what about the colors? Because you started to paint onto the sculptures too. Oh, well that was that was also as a result of materials. So so uh, early on I experimented with raku firing. I experimented with smoke firing, which was you know make a rabbit, put it in a barrel with sawdust and all kinds of other materials to make it make it have a color on it and then you know letting it burn in a fire for you know a day. Um so I, I experimented with everything. I tried uh, pastels on clay. I tried oil on clay. I tried acrylics on clay. I didn't like any of the surfaces 
um, that I came up with. And so um, I was trying also to find colors that I felt like went with the emotion of the sculpture. So, um, I mean, we're... We're talking a lot of experiment. I experimented on uh, painting on fired clay, made all kinds of little chips, you know. Anyway, the long and the short of it was I am an admirer of Judy Fox's work. She's a figurative sculptor. Um, and I I emailed her and I said, what are you using? And she said, casing paint. And I said, really, what's casing paint? I mean, that's how it started. So I started with my experimentation all over because it's a difficult paint to use. Um, the reason because it's opaque and I wanted some translucency, it dries to a different color than, a, than what you put on. Um, you can only put one or two coats a day. Uh, otherwise it doesn't really set up right layer on layer. So um, that's how I got into casing paint. And what I like about casing paint unlike putting oil or acrylic, on, for instance, on a clay, is that it has a feeling of almost being part of the clay, like more like a glaze. And I didn't, I, you know, I didn't do glaze on sculptures, although I love other artists who do do that kind of work, because uh, with glazing, you could spend three months making the clay part of the sculpture, and then the glaze could ruin the sculpture. See, you know, and one firing. So I wanted something that would, you know, the clay's done, the clay's fired, it made it through the firing. Now I want something that's going to, you know, work and not be another, oh, big problem <laughs> or potential big problem. Oh, man. Yeah, no doubt. Um, well, what's interesting about that is that you're almost touching on this other idea that I've kind of noticed for myself was an important part of my finding my voice, this knowing your world piece, like, because you talked about that you'd like knew that you really liked Judy Fox and that she like used certain paints like within hers. And you even like understand that there's other artists that are doing glazing, but that part of the problems involved in that. Um what is your sort of what was your process even back then or has been in your practice for kind of knowing all that's happening that you need to know like in the art world sort of researching what other artists are doing and just making sure that you're kind of current like with what you know would be inspiring to your practice like do you read um, certain magazines or do you yeah just what how do you know you know what i what I what I'm most inspired by, I think I, I take classes like um, I took your portrait painting classes, right? <laughs> uh, uh, every you know everything is like really helpful. That besides helping me with painting a portrait, it also really helped me with looking at color better and you know like uh, what colors I like. Um, oh, yeah. um, so so I take classes and I I research YouTube a lot. I see something that looks interesting like uh, jelly printing or something, and then I go research it. Um, you saw, since since I was at the academy and then here on in Nelson, kind of on, on my own, because there's no, you know, the, there are artists here, but it's not like I have access to big museums or anything. It's been pretty much, I've been doing my own little art class, art study. And and that's, that's um, you know, I have, I have done, you know, subscribed to things like acrylic magazine or something like that. But um, basically, that's that's how I get inspired. And when I travel or get to go to the San Francisco Bay Area to see family, then I try to get to the, the, all the museums that I can. Yeah, totally. Um, I love that. I love taking classes, actually. I think it is such <laughs> a great too. way. It's like I want to do it forever. <laughs> yeah, I could too. Like, oh, could be a perpetual art student, sure. Yeah. The best. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then how do you brainstorm ideas for like a new piece? Like, do you have any kind of process for brainstorming, whether it's like small sketches or little maquettes with the sculpture? Well, when I was doing the, when I was doing this last series, um, so like the in in the background behind me, that piece is called Jacqueline, Jacqueline Hyde. And it's a play on the uh, story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And it references, uh, in my mind, the um, uh, an abusive relationship. You know, there's the uh, orange jackal. You can't quite see, but he's ready to, if I scoot to the side, he's ready to, 
you know, pounce. He's, you know, the abuser and the, the, the yellow jackal behind him is the, um, um, you know, he's angry, but he's also frightened. So I was trying to portray that kind of, you know, relationship that people have. Uh, but that sculpture actually started from a book I read that was actually called Jackal and Hyde, um, uh, written by a therapist on on a verbally abusive relationships. And um, and it was inspired actually just by the title. I went Jekyll and Hyde. And then I went, oh, jackals, 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 Hyde. You know what I mean? I was kept playing with the words. So it, that's how that one started. Um, sometimes like rabbits, I've always kind of related to rabbits. So that, you know, I've made like an anxiety rabbit, I've made a passive aggressive rabbit, you know, that, that it's inspired by just that. I like that, that animal seems to speak to me in some way. But when I did this last body of work, my intuitive process was, and, and it was actually a game. The game was, I, I don't know what animal's going to pop up next but I have to follow it. And so hence, hence, <laughs> you know, it would start, you know, it's, it started with, uh, I think the anxiety rabbit was probably the first one. And then it went from there. So, and it surprised me sometimes what popped up, but that was the game. And I decided over the five or six years that I created all those sculptures that I was going to stay true to that intuitive process. Mm. So, so I actually love that the game that you have to follow it. You hear a thought and you have to follow it. That's like, uh, I really love that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> it, it was really, it was really strong and it, it, uh, a strong rule that seemed to came up, come up. And I used to I don't mm. do rules, but and it was, uh, and I said, well, and it and it kept working. So I said, well, well, you know, totally. let's see what happens. Yeah, I totally. also. I also kept making these sculptures and I didn't really know until I was getting more into the last four or so of them, what this was about. I just knew that they, they kept popping up and I decided to just keep following it. Oh, for sure. I think a lot of the time we like figure out what it's about later. <laughs> like yeah. something's coming into it. Like, yeah, we just get these ideas and we just have to follow it, but we kind of, yeah, we figure out what it's about later and write the artist statement. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so glad you said that. I'm glad. I'm, 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 good. This is, you know, like, you know, <laughs> other people do the same thing. <laughs> totally. And so, but how do you come up with the poses? Are you literally just stacking the coils and you're just like, I hope this turns into a oh. pose? Or do you have like some sketches and stuff beforehand? Uh, with the, with the, some of the, the more simplified pieces, um, uh, sometimes I, I just start I'm making a rabbit wow. there you go but the more complicated ones like the ones behind me I made two little maquettes for those and I kept playing in clay and they were only about oh maybe you know this big mm. tiny and in those maquettes I keep I play with them until and again I try not to think at all try not to think so I play with the maquette until it kind of has a postural feeling that I like and it has kind of a you know, at least in its its little form, it's it's you know it's looking a little evil. You know, mm -hmm. and I may exaggerate a few things. And what actually surprised me in doing maquettes is they actually, um, I've actually got it got the expression in a tiny little maquette, and I found I've taken out my calipers and go, you know, that was just the right amount when I extrapolated into like something behind me and those dogs those behind me those jackals are are like a large sized dog you know they're not tiny sculptures yeah yeah oh but I totally know what you mean I'm so glad you mentioned that it's almost like there's an emotional quality that comes out when we're doing these like little studies or little like maquettes like we're just putting our emotions into it and it just comes out physically and because I, I sometimes will do sketches or studies, but it'll have this emotional quality that, yeah, I just try to just blow it up. Like, I'm like, whoa, that really <laughs> nailed it. Like, <laughs> like, maybe there'll be tweaks to be done, but um, it's interesting. The other thing I do in making these sculptures is, is I research the internet. Like I go, what do jackals look like? And then I, yeah. and then I, I bet you I had 50, 60 pictures of every jack I could find, trying to find every view possible. Yeah. And then, and then I, but then I don't try to make it really look like a jackal. 
it really then goes back to the the maquette you know like i said the, you know that's more the expression that i wanted and again i'm not really not really into doing something realistic i have a lot more fun you know playing with what comes out than trying to make it look like something yeah and that word fun is important i think that ties into the intuitive process and finding our voice because it's like letting play come in and just follow like our thread of an enjoyment and maybe we're dealing with something whatever the themes you're dealing with maybe it's a hard theme or maybe it's not but there's still a certain level of play and fun involved in just like following these impulses I like that you mentioned and, that, and that's what I wanted in this actually this collection what I wanted was because I was dealing with you know abuse is not an easy emotion that people when they, they want to deal with when they come in a show so I wanted to do some of them that had humor and I think animals because we anthropomorphize them they uh you know they're it's easier to to see something or get something from an animal you know portrayal than a human portrayal of yeah. abuse let's say you know totally. and i so. think that there's something about the like beautiful quality of the sculptures and the colors that still like pulls you in and kind of entices you and then you can handle you know dealing with these things like yeah like abuse and you know but it's it's still really enticing <laughs> to kind of pulls you in visually it's a nice like an interesting contrast and you know, intuitively too, um, or, or or maybe feeling wise, when I was trying to figure out the color for each of these animals, because there's some pretty bright colors, some some of them. What I was what I would do is I would go I would go in and kind of try to go meditative state and go, what does that feel like? Like what is that emotion of that you know that anger feel like? And then um, and then I put all the all the animals that were done so far in a room and then I go and as a whole does this work as a palette you know it was trying to not only individual eventually but sort of make it work as a whole yeah oh I like I love that the idea of kind of closing your eyes and yeah letting your feelings trying to feel what you're trying to express and then the idea of working as a whole that actually kind of like touches on like when we're starting to kind of find our voice a lot of it ends up visually looking like what are the components of our voice like are there certain colors are there you know certain edge quality for me as a painter or is there you know a certain arrangement is there a certain composition for a painter or for you it could be a composition in terms of like the stacking of the um whether it's two objects and how they relate or whether it's just like one but um anyways you were kind of touching on color there and and palette and um I don't know. Do you have any more thoughts about this idea about finding the colors that work? Like, I kind of like what you were touching on you, colors you like and colors that work well together. But do you have any more thoughts about that? I do, actually, because um, I, I recently did um, Nicholas Wilton's class. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yeah. Anyway, he he has his early exercise in 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 the program of uh, where you make an artist inspiration board okay. and. I had an interesting experience with that because, as uh, you know, since I took your classes the last three years, I've really been working on color. Yeah. And so what I had done is I had done lots of paint chips, you know, four by four paint chips, uh, mixing all kinds of combinations of you know, one kind of yellow with another kind of blue with another kind, and then, you know, changing the yellow out, if that makes sense. Anyway, um, so what I did is I took all you know all these squares and I went through all of them and I and I just took a one inch chip of every color that emotionally moved me and I pasted them on a board and then I also had had xeroxed off the internet artists paintings and sculptures that I liked yeah. and when I put them up on the board I realized that the colors I had chosen were exactly in those artists paintings Wow. And it kind of, that, kind of, that surprised me. That yeah. really surprised me because I go, well, obviously that's the colors I like, you know what I mean? It was just, you know, and so that was an interesting awareness for me. So now I have a color palette to play with right now. I actually love these like logical processes that we can use because like sometimes we kind of like are so used to like not trusting ourselves in the real life that we have a thought <laughs> and then we're like, no, nah, it couldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> but then when we really look at it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I do like these colors. And I, 
um, do you like, yeah, this type of technique that these artists are using? I really love that. The next thing I was wondering about is what your studio practice is like. Like, do you work every day or do you, like, it must be a little bit more difficult as a sculptor because it's kind of a big production. Well, in, in, the, in doing the, that, this kind of work, I do try... I do try to, you know, like work like a regular business kind of day, you know, I work best in the morning. So, so the discipline for me is no, I'm not making doctor's appointments. I'm not doing anything in the morning because then, then, you know, that's when I have the most energy. So I try to, I try to work in the morning uh, with sculptures. You know, I have to plan vacations, you know, mm-hmm. around the sculpture because if it, and you know, I, Luckily for me, I do have people in town who are, you know, are potters and they can manage the clay for me. But I have, <laughs> I do try to time my vacation where it will be at a stage where I can leave a sculpture, even if it isn't fired. So that's, that affects what I do. I've had a poor friend of mine who was, who was, uh, I think it was actually on, on one of the jackals. And there, I I had gone on vacation and she was supposed to be monitoring the clay and she came in and she had over wetted and the head had fallen off and landed on the floor. And I kind of, oh <laughs> my was, God, she was because, very was distraught as you can imagine. Right. So, and because what you're talking about for anyone who doesn't understand, because what you explained to me before, it's like the clay will over dry. Right. And so you have to be kind of spraying it every day to keep it moist leading up to that time that you're firing and so right so that's what you're like kind of talking about but she had over watered it oh my uh, gosh but you got the head back on <laughs> well i just hit the head again but but oh, it just, my it just, i've done it to myself so so but actually uh, that's kind of interesting that need that sculpture has to have you doing a little something to it every day to keep it okay almost encourages just doing a little something every day like that's um, true. Because <laughs> because I know for me, like I had, um, you know, really bad artist block for quite a long time. And just there was so much self-doubt. It was like getting harder and harder to paint. And I started to do 25 minutes every single day. And it completely like transformed my process. And I can imagine that it like it sounds like you work probably more than that. But if you're just sort of spraying and doing a little bit, maybe you end up doing a little here and there while you're at it, like every day. Yeah, you're probably, you're probably <laughs> right. If you don't want to do it, right. And then you go, and then you like take the, <laughs> take all the towels off and all the plant and you go, hmm, maybe I should do a little something right there. <laughs> you're probably right. That's yeah. Good. yeah. Um, so then I guess you've probably always done that. I don't know. Was there ever a time that you weren't working every day? And like, can you see the difference between then and like the fact that you do now work pretty much every day? For some reason in sculpture, I never had that problem. Yeah. You know, I didn't even yeah. have the problem of, of uh, I didn't have the, even have the problem of the block, you know. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I, I think it's now that I've been playing with, the, you know, p- experimenting with painting actually for the last three years, I could see, you know, it's like in some ways like starting over. And, and I could see the tendency of a block Oh, yes yeah. yeah so I remember your 25 minutes you know yeah <laughs> it's a really good one and I swear yeah. there's something weird about time like 25 minutes doesn't sound that long but it's like it expands I don't know it's like all of a sudden you can get way more than you ever would have thought and done in 25 minutes <laughs> a day yeah Oh, well, it's been so amazing to talk to you. Um, where can people find out more about your work if they want to see your work? Well, um, I am, uh, my website is called sherlynhendrick.com under my name. And also my Instagram handle is the same, Sherlyn Hendrick. So and I'll definitely include a link yeah. to both of those in the description. That's awesome. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us, Sherlyn. It was so great to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks for making it easy on me. (laughs) (laughs) My pleasure. Okay. Okay. Bye, Bye, Christy. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Down to Art. Thank you so much for joining us.